what is Freedom Stories about? It's really looking at the stories of uh, former asylum seekers who arrived in uh, Australian waters around the period of 2001, that watershed political year of the Tampa children overboard. At that time, I was kind of up in Woomera in South Australia making a, a film for Film Australia about the history of the township. And of course, it, and it's got a very colourful history, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, but at that stage, of course, it was being used to uh, detain boat people. And uh, that was the, that was back 2001. By the time we were filming 2002, they'd closed down the, the detention centre. But there were still people living in the town in detention, community detention. And that was when I first started to meet asylum seekers from places like Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan. Because I was going to ask you, what is the story behind Freedom Stories? Well, that that was the beginning. Uh, we weren't allowed to interview them or anything. You know, the department forbade that because they were still in detention and it was for their own protection. Um, but uh, as I got to know them, I realised there were, didn't seem to be a great deal of difference between them and me when you talked about people's ambitions for life, their desires, their hopes, their dreams. And... Um, it didn't tie in with all that stuff I'd been hearing on the radio about queue jumpers, potential terrorists, opportunists, ready to take our jobs, etc. Explain to us the approach that you took with this film. Well, it linked that, those meetings lingered with me, Jim, for years. And as the years passed by, I made another film related to uh, refugee issues called Hope. But uh, I often wondered what had became of those people who were in the headlines 2001, all those riots. They eventually burned down the Woomera Detention Centre. They were so fed up with it. Where were they now? What was happening? I knew that 85% were eventually found to be genuine refugees. And so I set out to, to find some of them, really, and, and met all kinds of people in the process and began to realise that, OK, more than a decade had passed... This was around 2011 by now, 2012. But, it, you know, it had taken them that period of time to get over what they'd been through, get off of a temporary protection visa, become Australian citizens and really start to establish a life. And for me, that was the starting point of the film. It seems to me from watching the film that you clearly intended Freedom Stories to be an antidote to the hysteria that we usually get when anything about asylum seekers and temporary protection visas, etc., comes up. Is that a fair comment? You've hit the nail on the head, Jim. I should get you to write our synopsis. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, the, the film, it's not ambitious in some ways. It's not meant to be a, an overtly political film. I'm just saying, whoa, hang on a tick there. Just remember... These are people we're talking about. These are human beings we're talking about. These are people with dreams and hopes. Like they, they have more in common with us than the differences. And it's really upset me over the years the way people that come are punished, really, as a deterrent to other people that might think about coming. Whatever they've done, you know, whatever their situation... They get slammed in the detention centre and the government are quite open these days and maybe it's better to be open. Um, they're open about, you know, it being these policies being a deterrent. Can I just quickly ask you about politics? You said that it's not meant to be an overtly political film, but do you have a political agenda with this film? I have an empathy for people who are outsiders, newcomers. I mean, I fit that bill myself in some ways as a migrant here from England. But it's interesting, Jim, because I showed the film to one of the young, younger people in it. Um, so, you know, some of, some of the people were just kids when they're in detention. Now they're in their 20s. And she's been involved in activist stuff and done videos and propaganda. And she watched Freedom Stories, and I saw that she was in tears. And I said, what is it? And she said, this is the first film I've been in where I've not been kind of used for propaganda. This is the first film I've seen that treats me as a human being. You've deliberately gone for a length that is approximately twice 
what we normally get with a documentary on this sort of topic. That must have been a major factor in the style and the approach that you took. Yeah, well, it was always going to be a feature. Um, we, you know, we tried various things with the broadcasters in terms of getting their interest, and we couldn't get their interest. So you're then left with the question: Okay, we thought of it as a series of half hours. We've thought of it as this, this or that. If it's not going to TV, where is it going? And primarily, we want it to go to cinemas. And then festivals, and then community, and you know screenings around the country. So it seemed to us that length wasn't a big issue in this sense. We had eighty, ninety minutes in mind. It turned out to be ninety-nine, but in there you've got a dozen people and their stories, which is a lot more than I thought we'd be able to manage. You wanted to take the time to tell these stories in detail, didn't you? You didn't want to condense it into edited highlights no it's not so much detail because if you strip it back each participant probably only gets 12 15 minutes each so it's not so much it's not so much that we tell their stories in detail but i wanted to give them the time to just tell their own stories and i was convinced from the people that i'd met that if i just if, we, if I would just sit and listen to them for a while instead of the hysteria that surrounds them, I'd not only get a different story, but I'd get a very moving story and stories that haven't been told. I don't know if this was intentional, but one of the things that your film demonstrates is that when you have hysteria associated with an issue, that hysteria actually prevents you from understanding the subtleties of an issue that are necessary to understand it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And we, I was very keen to show, I mean, all these, all the stories have things in, in common, but they also have difficulties. You know, there's so many stereotypes. Take the stereotype of the journey to get here. Okay, it was tough for some people. Shafiq in the film, who's an artist and a painter and decorator, said it was the, what did he say, the, the, the freest nine days of my life on that boat. I was surrounded by the blue ocean, the horizon stretched forever, and I'd give anything to feel that free again. There's an argument in there between a mother and daughter. I don't know if you remember Ray Hanna and her daughter. For Ray Hanna, having been through what she'd been through with the Taliban, the Woomera Detention Centre was a haven for her. But her daughter, who was just a kid at the time, remembers it for what we see it as, in a way, as a prison. And they have this, you know, little exchange in the film about, Mum, how can you say it was a haven? And Mum's saying, well, for me it was a haven, you know. So I'm trying to get away from stereotypes, without a doubt. Now, surprisingly, there's not a lot of bitterness in the film which frankly is surprising and, Steve, a little suspicious. Is that the result of selective editing or is it the result of time uh, tempering the, the, the level of business they might have had shortly after their experience? What, what accounts for the lack of bile in the film? Um, I was surprised in general, and of course it doesn't apply to everyone. And, you know, we, we have a few other participants who didn't get into the feature just because of length and stuff. And their stories perhaps add some layers to what you're saying. But I was surprised by the level of magnanimity that these people have towards us. Amir is an example, four and a half years in detention. The government appealed his release all the way to the High Court for as long as they could. Now he's a real estate guy in Sydney, and he smiles a lot. And then I ask him in the film, how come you smile after all of four and a half years? And he says, you know, in detention, no one cared about us. We had to care for each other. He said, that's what I learned. I've learned we have to care for each other. Now, it's kind of, it's Nelson Mandela-ish in a way, although, you know, Amir didn't go through 20-odd years of incarceration. But... I have to say that if you want me to generalise, that's the direction I'll go in. There are people in the film 
damaged by their experience, particularly those who were kids in detention for a long time. Hamid is still angry, still getting into trouble occasionally, still run, having little run-ins with the police and so on. But, um, yeah, I was a bit surprised myself about that degree of generosity. And you've gotten some pretty major endorsements for this film, including from the late Malcolm Fraser. Well, Malcolm was someone we vis visited early on in our fundraising efforts when we realised that probably we were going to have to go for philanthropy if we weren't going to get film funding. And so we went to Malcolm, we went to Julian Burnside, we went to a few people. It wasn't that they were had money to put into the film, but we thought if we had a group of people behind the film who had the kind of respect that Malcolm has... Uh, it would help us, and, and in, indeed it did. Malcolm wasn't very involved, but we visited him occasionally, and I remember the last time we went, you know, he was in despair, really, you know, about what what to do about this asylum. What can you do, he said, about this asylum seeker situation when both major parties get their policies out of the trash can? And that's a quote I'll always remember from the late Malcolm Fraser. Now, I've got you on the record. Can you tell us a little bit about your approaches to the TV stations and your response? Yes. And their response. Well, SBS have looked, they looked at it in development and they've looked at it in post. In development, they said, uh, look, Jim, generally they say no and you left to work out why. But they just don't go back to where you came from or the first series. We knew that they'd put virtually their entire year's documentary budget into that series. And, you know, it did very well. It rated well and a lot of people liked it. When we went back to them in post, I think the problem then was we then had a feature film and they find it difficult to program a feature film. But when we pushed them on that, they just said... Um, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something like, oh, the film doesn't fit our brand. Now, you can speculate as to what they mean by that. So how to raise the funds for this? We raised the funds. We, got, we did get some development funding from Film Vic and Screen Australia, but because we couldn't get in a broadcaster in this, interested, we couldn't get production funding. That was when we went for philanthropy. Uh, the, a few trusts... Uh, were willing. The the Reed Trust came in first, gave us a grant. Other foundations followed. It took four years raising money as we went. We did the whole thing on the smell of an oily rag, really, in terms of a feature film. But uh, there are people out there concerned about the portrayal of refugees. And when they heard that this was an opportunity to facilitate asylum seekers telling their own stories they were prepared to put in some money as grants. The great thing about a grant is they give it to you and they say, we trust you to spend it. Film funding bodies aren't so generous. They want to know how, exactly how you're spending it and, and then to tell you how they think you should spend it. <laughs> tell us just a bit about the website and how you want this film to obviously go on to have an organic life online. Well, that's the... That's the great thing, although a slightly daunting thing about, you know, n converging media and the plethora of platforms that you can use these days, is that no material needs go to waste anymore. And we've always had this idea of a sort of multi-platform approach where we would reversion the feature as a series of shorts, add in a few more, that's your packaging for schools. Uh, an interactive website where we can deliver or stream this material in various ways and it will be searchable in various ways per detention center or, you know, whatever. Um, but also hopefully as, as an interactive site where other former asylum seekers can upload their own stories and start a bit of a dialogue going. Now that's a way off and every stage of this, of course, needs a bit more funding. But it interests me because I haven't, done that kind of stuff with films previously. I'm used to making a film and then kind of forgetting about it in a way. You can't do that anymore. And a lot of the emphasis now, even from philanthropy as well, when you've made this film, show us what you're going to do with it. How are you going to get it out into the world? And the question some people ask is, how are you going to get it out into the world to those people that really need to see it and not the converts? We've got to crack that one yet, I think.